You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 308, Exodus 32. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. I'm used to you being on my left side, and now you're on my right side, on the right coast. Yeah, no more left coast. We are in Florida, for sure. Yeah. How is it? Are you in shorts? (laughs) No, it's actually in the 40s here. You know, I I think that's one of the things that surprised uh, the kids anyway, that it could get cold here. I actually wore gloves one day, you know, but uh, yeah. hey, it's January. It, it'll it'll get warmer, and yeah. you know, I keep telling them that oh, it'll get hot. Now, do you can you count how many pairs of shorts you own on one hand? You're probably yes, have I to, can. Okay, so you're going to have to update your wardrobe to get more shorts <laughs> right. for the summer. But, right. Uh, yeah. So I mean, fill yeah, us in. how was that'll the, be a thrill. Yeah. So how was the trip? Now you've been there for a week or whatnot, and. Uh, briefly, let us know how the uh, Cross America drive was. Did anybody kill each other? Did the dogs survive? What happened? Well, no, nobody killed each other. Nobody got you know angry. Everybody got tired. I mean, it, honestly, except for me, it's just I I like long drives, you know. But I'm nobody likes them as much as I do. Is what it really comes down to. So, you know, I, I think it was a little bit tougher uh, on everybody um, than I thought it would be. Uh, because again, I'm I'm just into that sort of thing, but all together it was like 60 hours uh, in the car. And then of course you're you know you're stopping to take the dogs on potty breaks. The dogs were, were funny. Like for for t- first two days they wouldn't go. You know, <laughs> so that's like you know what's up with them? You know, do we have to stop every hour? You know, so they were a little out of sorts. But you know, a, a few days in they were fine. They were they were normal. They adjusted. So. You know, but I, I think everybody's glad it's over. Um, like I said, 60 hours in the car. We had five of the 12 days were eight hours in the car. So they're actually like 10 or 11 hour days. And then, uh, you know, the other ones were broken up. So we stopped at a few places, you know, Grand Canyon, Roswell. We we blew a day there because we, we have friends there. Did some touristy things, White Sands, you know, that that sort of thing. So we tried to do you know, little touristy things here and there. We went to Tombstone, which is really kitschy, uh, kind of a cheesy, you know, sort of Wild West thing. But, it, you know, it was fun. So it, it broke up the days, at least most of the days. But, yeah, we're we're definitely glad to be here. We're glad it's over. What did we listen to on the radio? Did you listen to audio books, podcasts, radio? <laughs> you know, I, I had planned to listen to audio books, but I I drove with Calvin, okay, just almost the entire thing. And Calvin liked my liked podcasts, so we listened to about 15 episodes of Monster Talk and um, the Saucer Life, which is one about UFOs. I mean, so we we listened to 20, 25 episodes of of uh, podcasts, and they were they were all at least an hour. Um, and I you know I threw in some audiobook stuff while he was playing games or something on his his handheld. So I was a little surprised by that, but. Uh, yeah, they would have been bored, or he would have been bored a lot, a lot more quickly had he listened to the audiobooks I had picked out. But and it was good. Yeah, he was into the into the content of the the other shows. And the dogs, how'd they do? They did pretty well. We had uh, we had Maury in our car, and all he did was sleep. But that, that he was entirely predictable. Uh, Norman had to sit on whoever was driving their lap. I mean, so when I drove for Drina, we switched cars. If, but he always does that. You know, he'll, he'll, he wants to sit on your lap and then he'll go to sleep. If he's not on your lap, he'll sit there and whine the whole time. So he's just, Drina's created a monster. <laughs> he's just so wet. And then Atticus, the, uh, the older one, went with my daughter and, and her husband. They had a, they have a Jeep. Uh, with you know, with a top, it's not open or anything like that, and he he did fine. So we were we were a little concerned that he would be nervous during the whole trip, but he was calm. So I that was a pleasant surprise. All right. So what's the general consensus uh, of you like in Jacksonville so far? Back in the city, things are down the street, grocery store. You don't have to drive. Oh yeah. I mean, what's 
I was geeking out at Walmart that like the first day because it's like, wow, you know, in five minutes, I'm, I'm here at this place where like everything that I would want to buy is in one location, which sounds kind of dumb, but where we lived, it was like the, the closest town was 10 minutes and you could get some things there, but like there were a lot of things you'd have to drive 30, 35 minutes to get. But where we live, the area is great. I mean, it's like everything we would possibly use, uh, even like animal pet hospitals and car dealerships and just, just everything, the whole bit is with, is 10 minutes or less, everything. So that, that's new. So that everybody's like, wow, this is awesome. You know, we're close to everything, 20 minutes to the airport. So it used to take me literally a day to fly anywhere, uh, unless, unless it was on the West Coast and it was like half a day because I was an hour and a half from Seattle. But that's, yeah, this is so much more doable, more reasonable. Yeah, but the trade-off there is uh, now you're going to have traffic and there's people everywhere. Yeah, but it moves. You know, it, yeah. it's just, you know, okay, we're five minutes away or we're five miles from everything. And that might take 10 you know, minutes or so, you know, because with the traffic. But there's a lot of it, but, it, you know, it moves. You know, granted, there could be some kind of problem and then you got to sit there. But, you know, that's what GPS is for. It'll take you take you another route. Everything is... You you can get to anywhere in three or four different ways, you know, yeah. because of all the the connecting highways and stuff. So it's yeah, you know, it's nice. And you're about ten minutes from the beach. Yep, yep. I mean, I'm not a beach person. I know everybody's shocked to hear that, but uh, yeah, we can get to the beach in ten minutes. If I said the over uh, under of you going to the beach this year is ten, would you take the under or over? Oh yeah. Oh, definitely the under. Oh, under. Wow. 10. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'll be lucky to go there at all. You know, it's just <laughs> <laughs> five, five would be more of a, wow. Okay. Of an edgy bet. <laughs> all right. We'll have to check in at the end of the year and see uh, if you made that under. So, yeah. Start your well, I'm, I'm now. pretty confident. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty confident. So. Uh, well, everybody else, you know, they'll probably do it, but yeah, not, not so much. Well, Mike, you know, uh, we pre-recorded the last couple ones, you know, cause you're traveling. So, uh, it's almost like we got to relearn on how to do this. Although it's been five years every week. Yeah. That little break. I'm like, uh, how yeah. do we do this? Well, what is it we're doing what, here? What does this <laughs> button do? Is this mic on? Yeah, check, right. check. But, uh, we're on, uh, Exodus 32. Speak, speaking of long journeys, you know, we are still in Exodus. Right, right. You're Exodus yeah. from Washington State into the... Yeah, I see what you did there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's real clever. Uh, clever. Yeah, Exodus 32. Um, and next next time we'll, we'll, we'll dip back into 32 next episode and do 33. Um, you know, I know, I, know, I know 34 will probably get its own episode, but beyond, you know, once you hit 35, a lot of it is repetitious. So I don't know yet. I'll have to just read through it and kind of see what we'll do with the last five chapters, but we're, you know, we're getting close to, to being out of the book at any rate. Uh, this episode though, the focus is kind of obvious and that is the golden calf episode. That's what Exodus 32 is about. So to jump in here, I'm going to read, um, maybe not the whole uh, episode, but you know, read, read a good ways into it at least. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord, to Yahweh. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. 
They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people and whom? whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. We'll, we'll stop there. We know the rest of the story. Moses goes down from the mountain and sees what's going on and so on and so forth. And we'll get to some of those details in a bit. But this is the gist of you know the chapter, the, the golden calf episode. Now, for the sake of time and Again, just being selective again. I just want to point out a few uh, sort of upfront items. There are parallels to the story in Deuteronomy 9, uh, 7 through chapter 10, verse 11, and also in Nehemiah 9, 16 through 21. So I'll refer to some of that material only when there's some point of interest. You know, we're not going to get full bore into comparisons or anything like that, but there are a few items that are, are worth bringing up in those other passages. And I'm not going to focus on the most obvious preaching points here. That'll that'll save us some time, like Aaron's excuse. You know, hey, you know, I just like threw this into the fire, threw this stuff into the fire, and out came this calf. You know, again, it's comical. There actually is uh, some scant ancient Near Eastern uh, evidence, you know, in, in texts that concern fashioning idols of, of that kind of language. So it's not sort of out of the blue, you know, completely. But, you know, it, it, it's silly. And it, again, it preaches well as an excuse. But I'm not going to get into that. I mean, that, that's sort of the surface uh, level stuff, the obvious stuff. Rather, I want to focus on what's under the surface and what's less obvious in regard to the English translation that we read and, you know, basically every English translation. Get into some of the uh, exegetical issues and some of the Israelite religion, divine counsel sort of stuff, that, you know, the, those kinds of issues. So let's let's start with the placement of the episode here in chapter 32. I mean, because we, we've been going along here in Exodus, you know, it, it's Exodus 20 when they hit Sinai and get get the law, and there's stuff going on. Then there's these rabbit trail, you know, kind of topics like you know instructions for building the ark and the tabernacle and all that, and and there's a lot going on in the text. And here in 32, this is 12 chapters later. Now only here will we do we get you know Moses, you know, still on the mountain. Like he's been on the mountain for twelve chapters here because we've the the, the text sort of rabbit trails into these different uh, different areas, so it feels you know kind of out of place. It feels like this should have come earlier or something like that because it's Moses dis, you know descending from the mountain when he he had gone up you know much earlier. Uh, Sarna writes in this regard: the account of the tabernacle is interrupted by the story of the making and worship of a golden calf. So. Not only does this feel like like it, it should have gone earlier because Moses is going to descend, but in the meantime, these rabbit trails about the tabernacle instructions, then you get this. and it, So even that stuff feels like it's interrupted. It feels kind of jumbled, you know, really. So Sarna makes this, this point about, you know, hey, we're going along with talking about the tabernacle. You know, that, that's a rabbit trail in itself. And then you get this sort of plopped in here, this worship of the golden calf. And he continues and says, this episode separates the detailed set of instructions from the report of their implementation because it's only, it's only going to be in chapter 35. We've, 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 we've got other chapters to go before we actually get to the building of the tabernacle, the building of its furniture. Again, what, why, isn't, why isn't this stuff logically grouped together? You know, you get the instructions and then the building. You get Moses going up and then coming down. Why isn't it all together? Why is it chopped up into pieces and sort of scattered? mixed up, you know, among, you know, the, the, the topics among themselves. Why is that? So Sarna continues, the literary arrangement conveys the impression that the apostasy of the people, that is their alienation from God, 
interfered with the building of the intended sanctuary that was to be the tent of meeting between God and Israel. The work could begin only after the reconciliation through the mediation of Moses. So this little comment here is sort of a precursor to something we're going to talk about a little bit in this episode, but more so in the next episode. Uh, the, The literary arrangement actually telegraphs certain points. What I mean by that is the the episodes are chopped up, both the episodes of Moses going up into the mountain and coming down, you know, and we get the golden calf ish, you know, problem, and the instructions and the building of the tabernacle being separated. The the content is chopped up and made disparate, you know, distanced from itself for literary reasons. Especially next next episode, we're going to talk about. Uh, some of the literary structures of chapters 32, 33, and a little bit even into 34, where you can actually sort of build a chiastic structure of these three chapters. And the only way you could do that is if the elements are separated and not taken and not discussed, not laid out consecutively. So the, the writer is doing this intentionally, even though to us it looks like he can't make up his mind about what to talk about. And it creates a disjointed chronology. It really sort of disrupts a chronology. But again, that's intentional for literary reasons to highlight specific points of focus for the reader, believe it or not. And we'll say more about that next time. But here, you know, Sarna is is suggesting already that, well, you know, if you look at it this way, then what you have here is is there, there's a there's actually a teaching point made that the building of the tabernacle, the actual construction, can't happen until this sin is dealt with. Uh, so that, again, that that's a teaching point that's brought out by the way things are laid out. But that's just one example. We're going to hit a bunch of others again, mostly in, in the next episode. So the 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 real place I want to camp here is on the incident itself, not the literary structure of the chapter. And of course, going into chapter 33, we'll we'll hit that next time. For this episode, I want to focus on, you know, what actually happens here and some of the language about these are your gods and and so on and so forth. Now, the sort of immediate context for chapter 32 is actually Exodus 24, 18. This is when Moses goes up. Into, into the mountain, into the cloud. That, that verse says, Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the, was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So that's actually the, the touch point. Because when you get to chapter 32, what provokes this, hey, you know, let, let's build, these, build the calf, is the fact that Moses hasn't come down yet. And people are kind of freaked out. Like, what happened to him? It's, four, it's been 40 days. You know, what, well, where is he? And for that matter, you know, God hasn't shown up either. You know, it's just what, what's going on. They're used to having Moses be God's spokesperson. They're used to having, you know, like, you know, hearing the voice of God on occasion or having some sort of visible manifestation that the presence of God is there with them, you know, good or bad, he's still there. But they're just like, what do we do? You know, we, the, the pattern's broken over these last 40 days. What, what are we going to do? Now I'm going to I'm going to draw a, a bit in the rest of this episode from uh, an article by Michael Hundley. I'm actually going to you know, draw from several sources across these two episodes that I put in the protected folder. But this is a really good article uh, by Hundley. It's recent, 2017. Uh, Hundley has done a lot of work on um, divine manifestation, uh, temples, temple presence. You know, divine presence, that sort of thing. This article is called "What Is the Golden Calf?" and it's a journal article from Catholic Biblical Quarterly, Volume Seventy Nine, Number Four, Twenty Seventeen, and it's twenty pages, five fifty nine to five seventy nine. I put it in the protected folder for those who are uh, newsletter subscribers. You can take a look at it. Hunley writes of this episode. Again, he he jumps into his topic this way. He says, Exodus twenty four eighteen. Again, that's when Moses goes up into the cloud indicates that Moses stayed on the mountain 40 days, giving no indication that the people expected so long a stay, and explaining their seemingly panicked reaction. Chapter 32 continues the non-priestly narrative with Moses still on the mountain, 
the Israelites are alone in the wilderness with nothing to do and no idea where to go, with both God and guide nowhere to be seen. Apparently in a state of panic, they construct a golden calf either to concretely manifest Yahweh's presence or to replace Yahweh as God and to replace Moses as guide and go between or to simply you know simply to render his role redundant so that that little selection there from Hundley kind of tells you it, it puts you in the mindset of the people they have neither god nor guide and they they got nothing to do where do we go they it's not a good situation so when you get to verse 1 the the people gather themselves together to Aaron it, it's a little more hostile <laughs> than that. Uh, the, the word in, in the ESV gathered to, the, the word to there is the Hebrew al, can very easily be translated against. They gathered themselves against Aaron. So you could really read this, and I think you probably should, that they're ganging up on Aaron. I mean, he's the one that's there. He's the one that's been the, the, the co-leader you know, with Moses. Moses, who knows what happened to that guy? And you know, we're going to go and rattle Aaron's cage, because we don't know what to do. And so they make it this demand, you know, make us gods who shall go before us, they say. Again, this is still verse 1. Now, gods there, you probably guessed, is the word Elohim. So you could also translate it God, singular. You know, recall Elohim is, is in terms of its form, its morphology is plural. But in terms of its meaning, the semantics, uh, it, it could be either singular or plural. Most often it's singular, overwhelmingly so in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's usually semantically singular, and that can be the case even when accompanied, when the, the noun is accompanied, as it is in this chapter, by plural verb forms. You can still have, uh, semantically, Elohim still points to the, a singular deity. Now, Hundley argues that the noun Elohim used throughout the episode is intentionally ambiguous. And he's gonna, he has a point to arguing that that we'll get to momentarily. And he says this ambiguity contributes to the questions of which god or gods are, is or are represented by the calf. And this is an old issue in, in biblical scholarship. You know, when they make the golden calf, are they thinking, you know, or, or should we read it as though that the people are saying, hey, this is Yahweh now, this, this calf. We're, we're still worshiping Yahweh and that but, but he's this calf. Or are they displacing Yahweh? Are they turning, you know, the, the first one is idolatrous because they're not supposed to do this. They've already heard, thou shalt not make any graven image. On Sinai, they, they, they should know better than this. So it's still idolatry. But the second option that they're just displacing Yahweh is, is sort of even more idolatrous. So what, but, but which one is it? It's an old question, you know, of interpretation when it comes to this chapter. And Hundley argues that the use of the term Elohim is you know, sort of keeps it in the dark and you have to, you know, discern w which one of those answers, you know, which one of those options is, is correct by other means. So Hun Hunley writes this. Let me just sum summarize it by what he writes. He says, to understand the people's intentions in constructing the calf, we will focus on two categories, which God is intended and what kind of image is intended. While the people's actions are relatively straightforward, their motives for and understanding of what they are doing remains relatively obscure, most notably regarding the identity of the deity whose presence they seek to manifest with the calf and their use of Elohim seemingly as a plural. You know, these are your gods. Whether purposeful or not, this very opacity serves the storyteller's purposes as it allows God and the storyteller to condemn their actions regardless of their motivation. We'll, we'll get back to the term Elohim in a little bit. There's more to say about the singular plural possibilities that the term represents. And we'll, we'll return to that in, in a little bit. For now, you know, we, we've got this ambiguity because we have in verse 1 up, make us Elohim who shall go before us. And so in verse 2, Aaron says, okay, take off the rings of gold in your ears and the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. Now, this is interesting. The gold rings, as Sarna points out, he says, these may have been among the items the Israelites received from neighbors when they left Egypt. As we read back in Exodus 11, 2 and 3, they take the spoils from Egypt and the Egyptians give them things, you know, to basically get them out of there. 
So Exodus 11, 2, and 3, Exodus 12, 35, and 36. But Sarna adds from the story in Genesis 35, specifically verse 4, which I'll just read that to you. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them, the, the, the gods and the rings, okay, under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. So Sarna says, when you look at that story, where earrings are coupled with these alien gods and are ritually buried with them, it is clear that they were not mere adornments, that the, these, you know, these rings of gold had some cultic significance. This conclusion is reinforced by the narrative about Gideon in Judges 8, 24 through 27. He, too, specifically requested gold earrings and manufactured from them an ephod, after which, quote, all Israel went astray, unquote, and which, quote, became a snare to Gideon and his household, unquote. So Sarn is saying, you know, th this is not just, hey, your, those earrings look nice, let's just use them for gold. I mean, even though they did that, there's, there's some cultic connection. There's some religious thing, flavor to them. So in verse 4, Aaron takes this material, these rings, he receives the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Again, the language here is odd. Sarna, again, I'll, I'll just reference him. Uh, the verb vayatsar, you know, and he, he fashioned, can denote he fashioned or he tied up. The noun caret, this, this tool, can signify a stylus or an engraving tool. The phrase may therefore mean that Aaron fashioned the gold with a tool. This, however, would be inconsistent with the description of the image as being molten, and one does not use an engraving tool on gold. It is possible that karet is a variant form of karit, a bag, which appears with the same verb as here in a similar context in 2 Kings 5.23. He wrapped by Yatsar the two talents of silver in two bags, karitim. In Exodus, then, Aaron tied up the gold earrings in a bag. Again, this is, what, this is Sarna's view. It is noteworthy that when Gideon made his image, he spread out a cloth, and everyone threw, it on, threw onto it the earring. Finally, the Hebrew phrase may well have originated in the technical vocabulary of ancient metallurgy and then become a metaphor, simply expressing the imparting of shape to metal, regardless of the technique employed. So what Sarn is discussing here is the language seems kind of odd. There's engraving language, there's molten language. What do, how do we know what Aaron actually did with the gold? You know, because some, you know, there, there's engraving and, and molten language going, we don't really know. So, so he's trying to link it to other passages uh, where maybe it just means Aaron put it in a bag and then they used it later and it melted it. It's like he did both. You know, who, who knows? Now, now Currid, who we've quoted before as well, his exodus work. He takes a slightly different tack here. He says Aaron's next act is to make the gold into a molten calf. The term molten derives from a verb meaning to pour out. And this is, by the way, you know, what, this is me interrupting now, you know, what, what the Hebrew text actually says. It has this molten language. Back to Curd. Curd says the idea is that the gold is melted down and poured into a cast or on top of a mold. Obviously, there's a problem here with the sequence of events. Why would Aaron work on the gold with a tool and then melt it and cast it? In reality, and this is Curd's different take here, it is not that difficult of a problem. What we have here is an, is an example of a figure of speech called hysteron proteron, which signifies that the second of two things is placed first. In fact, uh, this is a perennial cart before the horse argument. And Curd cites Bullinger, Bullinger's book, Figures of Speech in the Bible, uh, which many of you will have heard of, specifically pages 703 to 704 for other examples where the, this, the first thing is put second, the second thing is put first. This is just a kind of a literary you know, technique. So you, you shouldn't be reading, I, I get into this because you shouldn't be reading this or allow, you know, again, the village atheist you know, to, to come to you and say, look at this, you know, this is an error. It makes no sense. You know, why would he, you know, how, how could he carve something and then, you know, melt it? You know, it doesn't make any sense. It's an error in the Bible. Well, actually, again, it's, it's a literary technique, so it, it's not a big deal. And I think, I think what Curd says here is probably you know, the way to go with it. The, the major issue, though, the major excursus that I want to go on is the calf. And I think I've already hinted at this because of the term Elohim. You know, it, it, what we're going to get into here is not just um, related to the event, but bigger issues of Israelite religion and how 
Israelites. You have some Israelites. Again, you, you got to think of the Israelites like we would think of Christians today. And what I mean by that is under the label Christian, there's an immense amount of variety. Lots of Christians do not agree on all sorts of theological things. In fact, some Christians, you know, like what we'll say, like oneness Pentecostals, they don't even believe in a trinity, but they're still going to call themselves Christians. And you can argue whether that's legit or not. I understand that. But what I'm getting at here is when we talk about the Israelites, or Israelites thought this or that about Yahweh or El, the God of the patriarchs, you know, are they the same? Are they different? You know, do they overlap? You know, what's going on here? Okay, there, there is no single group known as the Israelites. The average, you know, you, you take a hundred, you pick the hundred Israelites out of the second millennium BC, you're probably going to get 10 opinions. Okay, it, it's just that sort of thing. One of those groups would be the biblical writers. So the biblical writers are not synonymous with the Israelites. And the Israelites, there is no monolithic group that's just you know, one mindset on anything, you know, any aspect of their religion. I mean, for goodness sake, they don't even have an inscripturated record, this thing we call the Bible. It's not like they, you know, have weekly or even monthly instruction. They've got a very small subset of theological knowledge, a lot of which has been passed on orally, and it's not even written down yet. They're not theologians, folks. And critics of the Bible need to need to own up to this whether they're evangelical in flavor or whether they're non-confessional. Because what, what, what critics like to do in the subject matter we're going to talk about here, the identification of Yahweh or El or either or both with a calf or a bull, what critics like to do is they like to, they like to take all of this and just lump it together into one monolithic thing and say that the biblical writers were polytheists. So the biblical writers thought, you know, it was okay originally for you know, Yahweh to be represented by a physical object. And then somebody later on, you know, in, in the 8th century, when idolatry was a big deal because of Jeroboam, then, then all of a sudden the theology changes and somebody makes up this story about the golden calf and sticks it back in the Pentateuch. You know, Moses didn't really write this, you know, to, to tie the later abomination, the later punishment of idolatry to, to give that mosaic roots. And so it's artificial. You know, we all know that they were polytheists because of this, that, and the other thing. They, they, the, the critics talk about the Israelites and the biblical writers as though they were of one mind. That's just bunk. It's just demonstrably absurd. I mean, we don't even have that now in the church with a couple thousand years of tradition and a Bible. Okay, the Israelites, you know, the people people who were, would have gone by, you know, would have considered themselves descendants of Jacob back in the second millennium BC, they don't have any of that. And so it's really absurd and self-serving for critics of any stripe to assume that everybody's thinking the same thing. That is just incoherent out of the gate. You know, and I'm sorry, you know, if, if, if that's going to, you know, pit me against, you know, some other person out there in the podcasting world or, or whatever, too bad. I mean, it, it, you demonstrate to me how that assumption makes any sense at all. Go ahead, do that. I mean, that, that's what I need. You know, where, where's the proof that everybody thought the same? Everybody belongs in the same bucket, including the biblical writers. Good luck with that. So again, with that little prelude, Let's get into the, the, the calf issue itself and the Elohim language and the bull language and the calf, you know, like all this stuff. Now, Curd writes this. We'll, we'll start with him. So just, I'm going to give you a little bit of Curd, a little bit of Sarna, and then we're going to go, uh, you know, into the details here and, and bring Hundley back into, you know, into our purview because he, I think, he thinks, you know, pretty well about a lot of the stuff going on here. Curd writes, bovines, again, calves or bulls, were commonly used to represent deity in the ancient Near East. Bovine cults flourished in ancient Egypt. Apis was the most important of the Egyptian sacred bulls. Isis, queen of the gods, bore cow's horns on her head. And Hathor had a bovine head. The calf was also a religious icon associated with the worship of the Canaanite gods, El or Baal. An example of a molten calf made of silver has been uncovered at the site of Ashkelon on the Mediterranean coast. Okay, some very just general observations from Kurd. Sarna gives us a little more uh, detail. He says, calf, you know, as far as the word calf, it's Hebrew egel, is a young ox or bull. 
thus Psalm 106, 19 and 20, in reference to this episode, to Exodus 32, alternates egel, the word for calf found in Exodus 32, with another Hebrew word, shore, ox. It, 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 it has them in parallel. It alternates between both. Throughout the Near East, the bull was a symbol of lordship, leadership, strength, vital energy, and fertility. As such, it was either deified or worshipped, or deified and worshipped, or employed in representation of divinity. Often the bull or some other animal served as the pedestal on which the god stood, elevated above the human level. Rashbaum, again, it's a Jewish commentator, and other medieval Jewish commentators have pointed out that the people could not have been so stupid as to believe that this freshly manufactured image was itself a deity responsible for the exodus from Egypt. Rather, they felt that the object was a potent symbol that acquired a numinous quality and that they could invoke the deity through it. Okay, that's Sarno. Now, Hundley echoes some of the same thoughts as these other two, but adds some interesting details. He writes this, As an artistic representation, how was a statue of a bull understood to depict the deity? In a religious context, we have roughly three options. First, a bull could serve as a representation of a divine form. In some cases, the people believe that the deity could actually take the form of a bull. Thus, by fashioning a bull, they were making a realistic replica of this divine form. Second option, a bull could function as a symbol or shorthand for the deity. Rather than literally depicting a particular divine form, people also used associated animals, which identified the intended god by association even when it was not literally depicted. In this case, the bull statue was meant to depict not the divine form, but rather the associated attributes like strength and fertility. Third, since anthropomorphic deities took human-like shape, Artists employed various means to demonstrate their superhuman potency. One way was to picture them astride and thus in control of various natural and mythological creatures. For example, Marduk and the Mushkushu, the mythological hybrid animal sacred to Marduk. Thus, the bull also could serve as a pedestal, a mount, or a throne for the deity. That's Hundley. Again, we can see from his comments that it's an open question as to who or what the calf or the, the bull, the ox, represented. Is it one or more than one? Which one is it? Again, those questions are still out there. And, and Hundley, again, gets into this more than you know, this source, more, more than other sources I'm aware of. Uh, he has this to comment. He, we're going to get back into the Elohim here. He says, while it is clear that the people are seeking a replacement for Moses as guide, they are, also, are they also attempting to replace Yahweh as God? That's, that's an important question. The people's reference to Elohim in chapter 32, 1 and 4 is enigmatic. Elohim refers both to the common Hebrew plural for gods and to the single Israelite God, Yahweh, as an abstract plural, roughly translated as divinity. Like Ilanu in Western peripheral Akkadian and other Semitic cognate expressions, the morphologically plural Elohim often functions as a singular. In Exodus 32, Elohim is accompanied by plural verb forms in verses 2, 4, 8, and 23, and plural pronouns in verse 4 and verse 8. That's the pronoun translated these, so these Elohim has, Elohim has a plural pronoun associated with it. In turn, Hunley comments, grammatically, it reads most naturally as gods. Granted, there are scattered examples in which the abstract plural Elohim takes plural modifiers, even though it functions as a singular. Sometimes that happens with verbs, Genesis 20.13, 35.7, Exodus 22.8. I've discussed a number of these in my paper, uh, my, my published journal article about uh, whether Elohim with plural predicator you know, should be singular or plural. So Hundley's pointing out, look, you know, this does happen when, when you have the plural form Elohim gets grouped with plural modifiers like verbs, but it's still pointing to a singular entity. So he says that happens with verbs. He says it also happens with adjectives, Joshua 24, 19, 1 Samuel 17, 26, 36, 
Uh, just to give an example of, of one of those, uh, you know, you have holy God, jealous God in Joshua 24, 19. Some, some of those adjectives are going to be actual, actually plural in form, but they're still pointing to one entity. And sometimes he says it happens with participles, Psalm 58, 12. Nonetheless, he says, uses of the abstract plural Elohim with plural verbs are rare. That's true. And nowhere else is Elohim modified by a plural pronoun. Again, that's kind of a point of interest. In context, he says, the singular designator fits more naturally, though. Since there's only a single image made, God's, the plural, appears nonsensical. Recognizing this fact, Nehemiah 9.18 appears to correct the plural to the singular. Nehemiah 9.18 actually said, instead of saying like Exodus 32 does, these are your gods, these, you know, the plural pronoun Elohim, it actually has the singular pronoun, zeh. This is your God who brought you up, again, singular verb from Egypt. So Nehemiah 9, sort of like Hundley says, sort of looks like it's correcting or, or clarifying this. Back to Hundley, he says, some commentators argue that the grammatically plural phrase in Exodus is borrowed from the Jeroboam episode in 1 Kings 12, 26-30, where two golden bulls are in view, and with polemical intent. Even in Jeroboam's case, however, the, pl the plural is peculiar. Since Jeroboam was a Yahweh worshiper, but he was attempting to establish rival temples to Jerusalem, and even with two statues, they would likely have spoken of Yahweh only in the singular. In addition, the liturgical formula would have been recited in the presence of only one statue at a time, such that the discrepancy remains. For now, we may conclude that we may conclude only that Elohim seems to be a uh, plural, but that doesn't really make sense in a singular situation. So, back to his question: Does the request tell us the people wanted to replace Yahweh with another god or gods, or does the golden calf represent Yahweh in their heads? So, let's start with the latter. Then this certainly has scholarly proponents. You know, some scholars not only believe the Israelites in Exodus 32 identify the golden calf as their god, you know, as as Yahweh or or, or El, the god of the patriarchs, but a lot of scholars, again, non-confessional, critical scholars, would would say that this episode can be used to distinguish El, the deity of the patriarchs, from Yahweh. Like like we we've got a mixed up polytheistic kind of thing going on here. For example, if you if you have DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, and you looked up uh, the entry on calf, this is written by Nicholas Wyatt, who I I really like but often disagree with. But but I, Wyatt, you know, is one of those writers that uh, thinks about a lot of things in ferrets. He's kind of like Margaret Barker, you know, always worth reading, even if you don't you don't like the the conclusions he draws from the data, or or don't find them especially persuasive. He 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 gives you lots of things to think about. Uh, Wyatt writes, uh, the bull as a symbol of physical strength and sexual potency, together with all the economic benefits arising from herding, has an ancient pedigree in the religions of the ancient Near East. The use of cattle as sacrificial animals is common throughout the region. Bull gods are widely evident. Then he cites a few examples in Egypt and Mesopotamia. And he gets to, to the Ugaritic material. He says, El was known as the bull El. And in, in Ugaritic, it's Thor Il. Now, Ugaritic and Hebrew are related languages, but not the same. The, the Hebrew word for bull is shore, and for, for in, in, in Ugaritic, it's thor. We've got a sh and th dialectical difference. I'm, I'm getting into that because that's going to become kind of important here. So in Ugaritic, El was known as the bull. Okay, This usage may belong in part to the convention of giving animal names as terms of rank to military personnel. And he cites a, a new Gritic reference for that. He says, uh, it, it at least suggests a popular etymological link between Thor and Hebrew Shor, and the Akkadian is Sharu, bull, and Hebrew Sar, Akkadian Sharu, ruler or king. He says all these terms are similar, so that may be you know, why they get mixed. You know, the, the bull becomes a, a, an icon of royal you know, leadership. Of whether whether the, the king, the royal king, is a god or a person. Back to Wyatt. Near Eastern weather gods are conventionally shown standing on a bull as a vehicle, while Baal is described in KTU 1.5 as copulating with a heifer, which suggests that he too could be regarded as a bull. Cult images of bulls have been recovered from such sites as Ugarit, Tyre, and Hazor. 
A number of terms for cattle are used in the Bible as epithets of divine power. The title Shore El, Bull El, has been discerned in the impossible Masoretic text of Hosea 8.6, which reads, Ki mi Yisrael, which translates into, again, kind of an incoherent, for from Israel. Now, the Hebrew consonants can be redivided to read this, though, Wyatt points out, Ki mi Shor El, for who is Bull El, which fits well into the context of Hosea 8.6. With this may be compared Jacob's title in Deuteronomy 33.17 as Bekor Shor, the firstborn of the bull. In Genesis 49.24, Psalm 132.2 and verse 5, Isaiah 49.26, Isaiah 60.16, we have phrases like Avir Yaakob, probably translated best as the bull of Jacob. While the divine title Avir Yisrael of Isaiah 124 is comparable, the term re'em, Akkadian remu, is generally thought to denote arox instead of bulls. So he's saying in, in that verse, you don't have shore, you have some other term re'em, but that's even a bull too. So what he's doing here, again, just summarizes, I'm not going to go through you know, why it's you know, data, is he's looking in the Hebrew Bible for places where you get bull language used of either God or the people of God or Jacob or Israel, you know, something like that. And he says this, he, here's his conclusion. He says, this is important evidence for the tradition that El, as a bull god, was the deliverer in the Exodus tradition. Now, what Wyatt is going gonna, is gonna, to, is suggesting here, he's saying, look, you got a bunch of Israelites, you know, and, and again, whether Wyatt believes in an Exodus or not, or a Moses or not, I, I mean, he's, he's, he's probably on the skeptical side of that. But he's saying, look, what do you have here? You've got Semites, ostensibly descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The deity names of the patriarchs are El names. El is identified with the bull in some Genesis passages and some other passages, you know, that, that we, we just read a few of them. So he's saying, look, they probably thought that their God was a bull God. And again, you, you look at it, and you, 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 on the surface, it's like, well, you know, I, I could see how that could be in their heads. You know, they, they don't have, they're not theologians. They don't have a Bible. This is pre-Moses. But there are problems. I mean, there, there, there are some coherence problems with this. And, and a lot of scholars are exactly where Wyatt is. This is why I bring it up. This is why I want to discuss it. So the, the thesis has problems. Generally, it, it's either an unnecessary conclusion. In other words, we retroject, we retroject things like Hosea. Eight or Jeroboam's incident back into the Israelites in Egypt in Exodus 32. We retroject later Canaanite Ugaritic stuff. I mean that 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 stuff post dates chronologically the time of the Exodus. And you know you could say, well, Wyatt probably doesn't even believe there's an Exodus, and so he doesn't see this as a chronological problem. Well, it, it is a chronological problem just in the way the story is related. You know, and if you're going to accept the historicity of the Exodus in any regard. The Ugaritic material is, is centuries later. So it doesn't seem fair to use that material to inform this earlier episode. It's just an, it's an incongruence. But even if, you know, even aside from that, if you take the prohibition against graven images earlier in the Exodus story, you know, I mean, that, that has to mean something if you take it seriously at all. Well, may, you know, Wyatt could easily say, well, maybe that's new revelation. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend Wyatt thinks that the, that the Exodus is real and, and so on and so forth. You know, somebody could come along and say, well, look, they, they were thinking that, that they're, they're, the El deity was a bull god, and then Moses comes along and Moses says, no, 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 no. This isn't what, what, who God really is. And Moses, you know, delivers them from Egypt, and they go to Sinai, and one of the commands is, hey, don't make graven images. That's new revelation. Well, again, you know, is, is, that seems a, a little better. It seems a little coherent. But is there any real evidence, aside from using terms like bull and calf as epithets? Because if, if you remember what we just read in Hundley, one of the options, there, there's three reasons why an ancient person would do this. Some would have thought that, hey, this is what our deity looks like. Others would have just used the terminology to say, these are the attributes of our deity. He's strong. He's powerful. He's virile. He's a creator. 
he has creative and procreative power. And that's the only reason they use the terminology. You see what I mean when I introduce this whole section about my little prelude that it, it's what critics typically do is they put everybody in the same bucket, everybody in the same box. They assume that all of the Israelites and all the Canaanites, along with, you know, a host of other people, are thinking the same thoughts. They're using the terminology for the same reasons. And then they want to lump the biblical writers in here and turn them all into polytheists. It's just not coherent, even on its own terms. People in the ancient world would have disagreed. There would have been a, multi, a multiplicity of religious opinion about how the gods were conceived. Even in the, among the people, the priestly class, or the, the artisans here who are making these objects, they wouldn't have even agreed as to why specifically they were important or why they were making them. Some would have thought, this is what the, the deity looks like. Others would have thought, no, it's just about the attributes. You know, you know it, 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 there would have been a difference of opinion. So it's really not fair to take the terminology and conclude, as why it does, that the Israelites at the time of the Exodus, the time of this episode, thought that their god was a bull, it was a bull deity. That, that, that just overstate. it not only overstates the data, but it sidesteps the reality that, religiously speaking, just like it is today, especially without inscripturated revelation or a holy book, without that, there's just no way that you can coherently say they were all thinking the same thing. There's no way you can conclude coherently that they're all on this, on this page, the page that you want them to be. And so there are just problems with this. There are other ways to think about the data that don't require presuming these sorts of things. Now, you know, you, you, you could say that this is new revelation because they've been in Egypt for 400 years. Who knows what they're thinking? You know, if they took their oral tradition seriously, where is the evidence? Because all we have is the written text. Where is the evidence in the written text in the patriarchal narratives that Yahweh was thought to be a bull god as opposed to just using these this this kind of terminology to describe an attribute of his where's the evidence that it has to be a bull deity you know it, honestly if and i want people to be honest here who you know as we go through the data we just don't have those data we just don't you know, ultimately in the Hebrew Bible as we have it, there's no endorsement of that idea that they thought this is Yahweh. This is like Yahweh's form, okay? There's also no endorsement of the God of Jacob being worshipped with a bull or calf or idols of any kind. I mean, look back in the patriarchal narrative. I mean, Jacob, when, when Jacob sort of has his, not his come to Jesus moment, but his come to Yahweh moment, he buries his objects. He doesn't use them and say, oh, well, I was thinking of Yahweh anyway. No, he buries them. He parts ways with them. So where is the endorsement that the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was worshipped with a bull or a calf symbol or any idol? Any idol? There isn't any. And, and, and so, it, again, it's just not legitimate to take these leaps in, in interpretation. You know, the, these ideas are speculation drawn from an epithet, like bull, you know, L, bull L, bull of Jacob or something like that. So you, we, people take the, the, this terminology under the influence of a presumed religious evolution, and, and they, just, they just say stuff that sort of sounds like it could work. But when you really probe it and you really ask them, well, how do you know, maybe you had an Israelite that thought exactly what you think he thought. Did everybody? Did the biblical writers? How do you, on what grounds do you lump everyone together? Tell me. Again, if you, you got to be honest. There are no grounds for doing that. There just aren't. So, you know, th this, is, this is the situation. I, I, I elaborate on this because you're going to run into this on the internet. You're going to run into this in, in, you know, podcasts, other podcasts and discussions and, and whatnot, where, again, the village atheist is going gonna, is gonna to come out and, and you know, Try to try to make this an episode of 
quote unquote legitimate idolatry. That this is really, you know, the Israelites really thought this way. The biblical writers really thought this way. And it's only like other parts of the Bible that contradict this this polytheism here. And then, you know, the Bible's just hopelessly contradictory and blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, you know the drill. You know the drill by now. And what I'm what I'm getting at is probe the idea. If it's true, then other things should be true. If it's true, then it should be coherent. You should be able to say certain things about the proposition that derive from the proposition, but in this case, you can't. And in, and in fact, it, it it lacks coherence. So again, we'll we'll move on here. But you know, in Hundley's article again, and you can reference it. You know, he goes through this option. He goes to the option that you know we've got. You know the Israelites thinking of of their own God El or Yahweh uh, with the golden calf, or they're thinking of other gods and so on and so forth. You know Hun- Hundley, you know, writes this. I think this is this section's worth you know worth uh, reading to you. He says to this point in Exodus, Yahweh has demonstrated his power by leading the people out of Egypt, and Yahweh Elohim has been the only God directly referenced. Indeed, nothing in the text to this point indicates that any deity other than Yahweh is in view. Thus, like Jeroboam in 1 Kings 12.28, the people most likely seek to elicit Yahweh's presence by means of the golden calf. This is where Hundley lands. He's thinking, you know, they're they're probably not thinking of other deities. They're probably building this calf, calf and they're thinking of Yahweh. Uh, Because Aaron, I mean, let's think about it. Aaron actually says, Hey, you know, like, 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 like when uh, when he he makes the calf and he says, you know, uh, in verse uh, verse four, he Aaron received the gold from their hand, fashioned, it, and he says, "These are your gods, O Israel." Uh, the, the 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 people say that. Hey, th- this is our Elohim. These are our Elohim. And again, it could still be singular, like we've talked about. And then Aaron in verse five says this: he, When he, Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, "Tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh." So, you know, Hundley looks at this and he says, you know, you, you could read that and say, well, you know, maybe they're thinking this is Yahweh. You know, as as awkward as that seems, as as ridiculous and absurd as that seems because they've just been told not to make graven images. You know, the people go along with Aaron's identification of the calf with Yahweh. Aaron is the one who makes this identification. And the people don't object to it. They don't say, wait a minute, Aaron. You know, we were thinking of some other deity. I mean, they... they there's no objection on their part. They go along with it. And Hundley adds this, by contrast, in Exodus 32, 26, the people do not respond to Moses' call, who is on Yahweh's side. You know, it, it, the, the, it that's, that's like, it's showdown language because, you know, when Moses says that, and Moses is obviously opposed to the golden calf, they know they're kind of in trouble <laughs> because if, if, they, if they are on Yahweh's side as Moses defines it, then they shouldn't have been doing this, you know. It, so it, it it gets a little dicey, you know, when with with the language here. Uh, you know, again, another another little thing from from Hundley. He says, in short, it is clear the text is clear. The people seek a tangible divine presence. Again, it remains unclear, however, if the presence they seek is Yahweh or another god. Aaron again certainly thinks he makes the identification. There's every reason to think they hope. To con- concretize Yahweh's presence, yet the text again is still you know, it still has these ambiguities in it. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to dismiss the people's actions as blatant disobedience. From their perspective, however, the situation is critical. They try to do the best they can with what they see, yet their vision is limited, as they are not privy to the events turning you know occurring on the mountain above. Moses, the guide and go-between, is ostensibly gone. Yahweh is inaccessible. With no one to protect them to lead them, no way forward, nowhere to return, they likely fear for their survival. In their presumed desperation, with no other obvious solution available, they use whatever means and agency they have to forge a way forward. Like their neighbors, they make an image to serve as a focal point of presence, protection, guidance, and hope. Faced with a lack of a tangible, visible deity, they make a deity tangible and visible on their own terms. You know, and again, there, there's a lot that we, that we could we could say about this. I mean, it, it's obviously portrayed negatively. People rise up to play again. That it's, it's a term. If you, if you look up the the, the term, uh, it's tzachak in Hebrew, Genesis twenty six eight, Genesis thirty nine fourteen. 
it has a sexual context there. It probably is refers to it's probably better translated something like dallied with, maybe seduced, because the Exodus thirty nine reference is the reference to Pharaoh's wife accusing Joseph of, of you know tzakach, again dallying with her, actually accusing him of doing the things she's doing. So it's a negative portrayal. Again, you, you get the sexual element, spiritual adultery, you know, used with idolatry elsewhere in the Old Testament. You get the flavor that that even if they think that they're worshiping Yahweh, even if even if they're desperate, and even if we can we can understand as human beings their fear and what's going on, you know, again their their desperation in the situation, because Moses is gone, they have no direction, no leader, they can't go forward, they can't go back. All that being the case it's still viewed as sinister and evil in the text because it violates the earlier command. And you see this as you go through the chapter. In verse 7, the, <laughs> I'll just read you verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land have corrupted themselves. <laughs> I mean, before God had been referring to Israel as my people. Not here. Now it's your people. God is distancing himself from from, from the Israelites. You know, he says in verse 8, they have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. You know, again, <laughs> even there, the text doesn't say, as Sarna points out, the text doesn't say they've turned aside from me. They have turned aside out of the way I commanded them. So basically they've adopted, you know, pagan modes of worship, using them in the worship of the God of Israel. So Sarna and others, you know, take that, that little that phrasing as indicating again they're 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 trying they're, they're thinking they're worshiping Yahweh but they're really not so in one sense they haven't turned from worshiping Yahweh like they're not worshiping some other deity but they but God says look they have departed from from what I command them to do they might think they're still on my side they might think that they're still worshiping me but they have gone astray you know Yahweh certainly doesn't think he's being worshiped in in, in the text the language shows God distancing himself you know, from the whole episode. And Hundley comments on that too. He says, since divine approval is necessary for divine presence, Yahweh will not deign to associate with the image even if it was crafted for him. From Yahweh's perspective, whatever it is, it's not him. Rather than elucidating whether they are worshiping him the wrong way or another deity, Yahweh condemns the whole enterprise out of hand. Having seen the people's behavior and their character, he is prepared to destroy them and start again with Moses. That's verses 9 and 10. And you could, you know, end it right there. It's a good preaching point. God doesn't care if your motives are pure, if you worship him as you would worship a foreign god. That, that's Really, that's the bottom line of the passage. Even if you think you're worshiping the true God, if you're doing your, you know, your worship in a way that you'd worship some foreign god, God's not going to accept it. But, you know, I want to wrap up a little bit. I'm going to just say one, a couple more things about the, the Elohim. Again, you know, you, you have, you know, why does, why, why again, you know, the, the ambiguity in the first place? And just to, to cut to the chase, what I, I, I'm in agreement with Hundley here. And again, you, if you're interested, you can go look up, look up the article. He writes this, the, he points out that the Bible uses plural forms for a singular deity in the context of, of heterodox worship in other places. And for him, this is the key, that they think they are worshiping Yahweh. And they might be, in their hearts and in their heads, that might be what they're thinking, but God says, it's wrong. I don't accept it. And in some of the examples he has are kind of interesting. Uh, in 1 Samuel 4, 7 and 8, when the Philistines notice the presence of the ark in battle, they, are, they at first proclaim, Elohim has come. And the, the has come there is a singular verb form. Elohim has come into the camp. But in the next breath, they resort to the plural. Woe to us, who will save us from the hand of these mighty Elohim? These, plural, are the Elohim who struck, plural verb, the Egyptians with every kind of plague in the wilderness. So you, what, what Hundley uses that to point out is that, look, you're going to have passages where there's this back and forth between singular and plural use of Elohim, and often it is associated with pagans misunderstanding who Yahweh is and how Yahweh should be worshipped. And so in Hundley's view, this is why Exodus 32 
makes the term Elohim ambiguous in the text. Is it these or, or one? Is it plural or one? It's as though, Hundley would say, that the writer of Exodus 32 and the writer in that case of 1 Samuel 4 are trying to telegraph heterodox worship, apostate worship, even of the true God. I mean, the Philistines, they know who the Israelites worship. They worship this deity called Yahweh. But but it's like they can't decide if if Elo, you know, if it's one or many. And so when you do the same thing in Exodus 32, or rather when you see the same thing in Exodus 32, Hundley's argument is that, you know, a reader of the Hebrew Bible would would know that when you get this kind of weird is it or isn't it, singular, plural, Yahweh or foreign God, that that's deliberate. It's telegraphing to the reader that what's going on in this chapter is worship that is illegitimate, that Yahweh refuses to accept. Even though the people are in crisis, their crisis is understandable. What they're trying to do is, is bring Yahweh back to their midst so that they have guidance and they have they can feel some security or whatever. As, as good as the motive might be, this is illegitimate pagan worship. And God doesn't accept it. So again, I think that's it's kind of interesting in, in the chapter. Again, like I said at the beginning, I wanted to focus on something that's sort of operating beneath the text that you're not going to get from your English Bible, although you, you could you know look at, at the narrative and notice that Aaron makes one calf, but then it's referred to as these are your gods. You could notice that you know in a, in a close reading of the English Bible and wonder about it. And I, I again, to me, I think it's interesting because it takes us into this, what in the world's going through the mind of the Israelite when it comes to thinking about God in an era before they have a Bible? And they've been in Egypt for 400 years, and nobody really knows what's going on. And you got this guy, Moses, who takes them to the mountain, and there's spectacular things that happen along the way. And then you get these commands, and then Moses goes up to receive the law, and he never comes back. At least he hasn't come back for 40 days. I mean, again, putting the people in, in their context you know, in, in crisis, they don't, they, they can't go look up how to parse this in a theology book. They can't go ask anybody, hey, what does all this mean? Instead, again, they, at least some among them, again, it's not everybody, it's some among them, believe that by fashioning this object and this object, has a long history in the ancient Near East, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, and in Canaan. They fashion an object that represents the attributes of Yahweh, the attributes that they perceive Yahweh to have, in an effort to honor him, in an effort to make him present in their midst, in an, in an effort to, to, again, to, to have the presence of God in, in their midst, to come back and give them direction and hope and so on. You know, all the, the motives are good. On a human level, they're understanding, but the text makes it very clear that this is unacceptable to God. And it's not unacceptable because he thinks they should be theologians. It's unacceptable because he has given them a very short list of commands. They've, they've, they've heard them already, at least, the, again, the, in the context, uh, again, you, you, you have this revelation given in Exodus 20, you know, about no graven image. And even if they hadn't heard that yet, because Moses hasn't come down you know, from the mount. Again, the reader is getting a different impression than somebody you know, who has the boots on the ground there in the actual incident. So even if they've never heard that, they should have known, based upon their own oral tradition of their own patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that their forefathers never made idols to worship their God. They didn't do that. And so this is a clear violation. They didn't know much, but they could have known that much, and, and God doesn't accept it as, again, as realistic and as understandable as the situation is, it's unacceptable. And so that, that's really the, the main focus of the Golden Calf episode. So again, there's lots of things we could have talked about here. I thought, again, this was a good example of something under the surface that gets us into the world of, of how you know scholars look at, at these passages. And again, I think that's practical because, again, you're going to run into this on the internet. And I think if you really you know stop and think about what's going on here, it's understandable both in order to tell the ins and outs of the episode, 
but also, uh, again, having enough of a grasp of the situation, you know, to, to, to think well about the text and not be unduly influenced by poor thinking on the critical side about the biblical writers, you know, being polytheists or something like this. Again, this is a subject that has come up a lot of times on this podcast because we do, we do divine counsel stuff. And you'll often hear it, but when you really probe it, when you, when you really think about it, the whole approach has serious weaknesses. And so I think that comes through once again uh, in this chapter. So in part two, or at least in the next episode, well, we're not going to call it part two, but the next episode, I'm going to revisit this episode a little bit and discuss its relationship to chapters 32 and 33. And we're going to focus more on literary terms. You know, why why does the story unfold as it does, sort of in chunks that don't, you know, that, that you'd think would be logically grouped together, but are separated and kept apart? Again, there are some reasons for that literarily, and then just some other things that this chapter informs in chapter 33 as well. So we'll get into that next time. All right, Mike. Well, we will be looking forward to that. And uh, again, we want to welcome you to the uh, right side of the United States. Uh, <laughs> And also in the in, what you're in the saying is no, no more left coast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said it, yeah. not me. But uh, all right, Mike. Right. Well, we'll we've got people. we've got lots of friends on the on the left coast. So yeah, uh, I hear you. And real quick, who's your Super Bowl prediction? Oh boy, predict well. My my Packers just uh, let's not talk about that. Uh, looked really bad. Um, I'm hoping Kansas City wins. So I, if you want a prediction, uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna say I'm I'm hoping they win. A fellow Red Raider, so I'm rooting for you, Mahomes. So, uh, all right, Mike. Oh, yeah, that's right. You, you have a connection there, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, all right, Mike. Well, with that, we'll get people out. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.